percent, 90, all pain's gone. Excellent. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's always good when they come forward with pain, but leave with no pain, right? So we're thankful for that. I want to talk to you about worship uh, for a moment. Uh, Psalms 150. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud, everybody say loud, Loud. cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Uh, When Jesus met with this woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, she asked Jesus, are we supposed to worship this on this God on this mountain or God on that mountain? And Jesus said, no, uh, God is is looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we have to understand that God is not a God who is looking for worship. God is a God who's looking for worshipers. God is looking for an individual who will empty out their heart and uh, in expression to Him, who will offer their bodies as a living sacrifice, pure and holy, pleasing in His sight, which in Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us that that is an acceptable form of worship. So God's not looking for voices. He's not looking necessarily for hands. He's not looking for music. God's looking for worshipers. And the danger is substituting worship for worship. Now see, we have, we have what, what we like to call the worship wars. I don't know if you're... Uh, no generation, including my, my own, including the generation that's coming up after us, No generation should ever have the right to claim that their worship is the only acceptable worship to God. We have to understand that when it comes to music, music is both cultural and generational. I grew up, I was born in 1974. For some of you, that's old. For some of you, that's young. I'm about right in the middle. But 1974, that's the best year to be born. And Jody said, Amen. Uh, I was born in 1974, and I have many fond memories. My dad was a hippie, all right? And I have many fond memories of walking into my home, and my dad had this stereo system, and I'm telling you, he still has it to this day. I don't know how old this thing is, but it still works, and it still sounds good. So he spent, he spent a lot of money on a good stereo system. My dad was a hippie, and he loved music. And I have many fond memories of walking in, to my house and hearing the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr. I know all of them because I grew up with it. My dad had almost every one of their albums. And now, here's my son sitting on the front row, and I could say, Ethan, do you know who the Beatles are? And he would say, no. (laughs) He's probably never heard a Beatles song in his life. Because I got saved and I gave away all that stuff. Even though every now and then, you know, a little let it be, uh, you know. (laughs) It's not very often, though. I promise you that. It really isn't. I have to catch it while I'm turning my station to the Christian station. If one of those pop on, I might just for a second reminisce. For just a second. (laughs) But my point is, is that music is generational. I remember riding in my grandparents' old Pontiac and my grandfather on the AM station. Are you with me? Back in those days, if you listened to FM, it meant you were young and hip, you know. If you listened to AM, it still, well, I'm not going to say that, but. (laughs) So I get into my grandparents' car, you know, and they're blasting the AM station, you know, and I'm trying to rack my brain to think of one of the songs right off the top of my head, but it's not, it's just not coming to me at the moment. But you all, most, many of you know those songs, right? In fact, here in a couple of weeks at the Shade Gap picnic, from what I understand, there's one guy in particular that, that sells out, you know, sells out, whatever night that is. What's his name? Little Davy or something? Leroy. What is it? Leroy. Leroy. I don't know who I'm talking about. 
But I saw him play last, you know, last year, and I, and I know that some of you wanted to get up there and dance, but the pastor was there, so you couldn't. <laughs> You're not fooling anybody. I'm just saying. So music is music is generational. Now. It's cultural and it's generational. If, if I take you down to South America, you're going to experience a Caribbean type of music, a lot of drums, uh, a lot of type of music. If I take you to Hawaii, you're going to experience an island uh, style of music. Bill and some of, us, uh, some of these guys have been to Africa. Their music is completely different. It's cultural. Are you with me? And now here we are in, in Shade Gap, West Virginia, or Pennsylvania. <laughs> Like I said, it's cultural. <laughs> and listen, okay, let me just, I'm wasting a lot of time here this morning. <laughs> listen, don't make fun of West Virginians, okay? <clears throat> listen, I've been to the Hill Valley Racetrack, okay? That's all I'm going to say. But music is, is cultural, it's, it's generational, and now the problem is, is that we all come to church. We're all different generation, many of us are different cultures, some of us are implants, some of us are natives, we all have our things that we like, we all have our things that we dislike. My struggle is, is that it seems like when we get into these debates about music and style and worship, everybody comes and says, well, this is what I like, this is what we like, this is what we like to sing, and it just seems to me that no one has ever asked God what he likes. You see, we actually have specific instructions and specific commands from the book of Psalms and throughout the Bible of the type of worship that God likes. Do you know that God likes singing? He likes singing. 150 Psalms. Do you know why there's 150 Psalms? I believe Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. It's because there is no song that will ever adequately describe who God is. There's 150 of them, and I think God just had to finally say, okay, that's enough, 150. We're going to have to stop it there because if we don't, it's just going to, we're, the book's going to be too big. People aren't going to be able to carry it around with them. So God stopped at 150 because there is no song that adequately describes who God is. The Bible says that He is multifaceted. We're going to take all of eternity to get to know Him. But God likes singing. God likes uh, from some commands from the book of Psalms is to sing Shout, to clap, to dance, to leap, to fall down, uh, to bow down. We read from Psalms 150 about the clanging symbol, the loud symbol. How many times have you heard people complain it's too loud? You know, sometimes God likes it loud. And there are times when God likes it quiet. There are times when we're called to be still. Be still and know that He is God. All of these are forms of worship. Now let me ask you this question. Out of all that list, which of those did you do this morning? Pastor Ken, I'm not used to lifting my hands. It's okay. Just start out right here. <laughs> just start out small. You don't have to, you know. Just start out small. I'm not used to dancing. Funny thing is, I've grown up in a Pentecostal church my whole life, and I can't remember one time I ever saw anybody dance down the aisle. We say they get fleshy, you know. They're just, they just want attention. They're just full of flesh. Well, do you know it's also equal amount of flesh to just stand there and do nothing? Yes. Yes. To not respond to the presence of God? Because those are commands. They're not suggestions. They're not, uh, you know, hopefully maybe you'll do this if you get around to it. They're commands from Scripture. There's two people in the Bible who got a really hard time from the religious crowd when they worshiped God. One of them is David. As the ark was coming in uh, to Jerusalem, the Bible says that David stripped off his clothing. He had a linen ephod on. Uh, which was a priestly garment, and the Bible says that David danced like a madman before God. And his wife despised him for it. She despised him for it, but do you know that God honored him for it? When true worship comes out of the life of an individual, 
one of the one of the elements is always that there will be backlash and there'll be complaining, you know. If someone would have gotten out of their seats this morning and danced down the aisle and came up here and danced, some would have said, well, that's beautiful, it's a good expression of worship, and some people would have complained about it. Because the religious spirit always wants to silence worshipers. In the New Testament, there was a woman who brought an alabaster box, a, a jar of perfume to Jesus, and this was a true expression of worship. There wasn't singing, uh, there wasn't dancing, but it was still worship. And the Bible says that she poured out all that she had on Jesus' feet. But it isn't interesting, Jesus honored her, but the religious crowd despised her. (laughs) You know, the funny thing about worship, and the funny thing about the argument that always seems to go along with our style of music is, is that we, you know, some people like the old stuff, some people like the new stuff. But it's, isn't, isn't it true that the old stuff once was new? Yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you open your hymnal, you'll find a man by the name of Isaac Watts. Back in the early part of uh, the 1700s, Isaac Watts was born. And back in those days, in the 1700s, they did congregational singing, mostly without music, and it would go kind of like a chant. A deacon or an elder would get up, they would literally open the book of Psalms, and they had certain tones and and melodies that went with some of the Psalms out of the book of Psalms, and the deacon would recite the Psalms, and then the congregation would sing back to him. And this was the style of worship in the 1700s. Well, here came a man by the name of Isaac Watts, and he didn't like to worship. He thought that it was dead. In fact, he, in fact, he said, while we sing the praises of God in his church, we are employed that we are employed in that part of worship, which of all others is the nearest to heaven. But it is a pity that this of all others should be performed the worst upon the earth. What he was saying basically was, worship is dead, and somebody needs to do something about it. In fact, he went to say this. It's pretty interesting. He said, that very action which should elevate us to the most delightful and divine sensation doth not only flat our devotion, but too often awakens our regret and touches all the springs of uneasiness within us. That's an amazing statement. I don't know if you understand what he's saying. He's actually saying that dead worship produces deadness in the life of a worshiper. Because worship is meant to literally take us into the throne room of God. It's meant to take us into his throne room. It's meant to allow us to experience the joy that's in heaven. It's a, a, the, the atmosphere that's, that's in heaven. I, Isaac Watts wrote over 600 hymns. His father, who was a minister in the church, Isaac came to him. He was complaining about the worship. So his father looked at him and said, well, then why don't you do something about it? And so for the next two years, he wrote a new hymn every single Sunday. In other words, whatever church he was going to at that time sang a new song every single Sunday because of Mr. Isaac Watts. What songs did he write? Well, you might be interested to know that we still sing of them, sing some of them. For instance, Joy to the World, Mr. Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross, On which the king... I'm messing it all up, but you guys know it. He wrote that. When I survey the the wondrous cross, as a matter of fact, many of his songs are still in our hymn book today. That was in the early 1700s. In the late 1700s, a man by the name of Charles Wesley, who started the Methodist movement, was doing camp meetings. Now, by that time, 80 years had gone by. By that time, Isaac Watts' music was already in the hymnal. Are you with me? Already published. Churches were already singing his songs. Here comes Mr. John Wesley. He's doing camp meetings. He's doing revivals. Guess what? A new season in the church. You know what the church wanted? New songs. Mr. Charles Wesley, who's actually in our hymnal as well, started writing what we call camp meeting songs. 
Well, this was completely different from Mr. Watts's style of music. So guess what happened? Some of the church didn't like Mr. Wesley's songs. They wanted to sing Mr. Watts's songs. So there was backlash. Now fast forward to the 1800s, Azusa Street Revival. The church has been now singing Charles Wesley's songs for almost 100 years. In fact, a little over 100 years. Charles Wesley, Isaac Watts, and now during the Azusa Street Revival, we have songs such as Victory in Jesus. We have songs like we sang this morning, We Shall See the King. These were called gospel songs. Well, let me tell you, there was a lot in the church that didn't like gospel songs. They wanted, they wanted the camp meeting songs. They wanted the old hymns. And what I'm trying to tell you is that in every generation, every century, the music has changed. And every time the music changes, the, some of the church receives it and some of the church doesn't want it. That's right. That's right. Do you know that no less than nine times in the Bible, God commands us to sing a new song? What we don't understand is that worship brings a breakthrough. Yes, we can pray for healing, and, and many times God does that. I remember one time we were getting ready to go on a trip, and, and Ethan actually was getting sick. We were in West Virginia. The next day we were leaving to go over the road. I told you last week about our over-the-road experiences with our kids, if you remember. And Ethan was getting sick. We had to go out of town. He was running a fever. He's talking about his stomach hurting. And we're leaving the next day to go out of town. And so that night, after we put Ethan to bed, me and Krista went into the living room. We put on some worship music, and we just began to worship. And the presence of God entered the room. I believe the presence of God filled the whole house. And when Ethan woke up in the morning, he was perfectly fine. There had been a bug going around the school and I'm sure, I'm certain of it, that he was catching whatever that was. And what I'm simply explaining to you is that worship often does things that we can't even see. And in the book of Revelation, this is, of course, John talking. And John says, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. So what we have occurring here in the throne room is that there is a scroll and there's no one worthy to open the scroll. John actually becomes emotional because no one can open the scroll. But all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, uh, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prevailed. And in verse 6, John says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent into all the earth. Then he came out and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang, what is it? A new song. They sang a new song. Now what I want you to understand is what is occurring here. Twice in the book of Revelations, it tells us that they sang a new song. And in both instances, there is a similar pattern that surrounds this uh, experience. And what connects both of these events is that when a revelation of Jesus is released in the throne room, there is also a new song that is released because of the new revelation of who Jesus is. You saw there in verse number six or verse number four, John was weeping because no one could uh, read the scroll. And then in verse number six, verse number five, I'm sorry, there is a revelation of Jesus that is released. And the revelation is that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he is the root of David. And then there's more revelation even after that. Uh, in verse number six, uh, there's the four living creatures in the midst of the elders. There's the lamb who was slain. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. This is all revelation. What book are we reading from? How did John receive the revelation? Revelation chapter 1, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
It was Sunday. John was worshiping. And because John was worshiping, he was in the Spirit. He's in the Spirit worshiping. And as he's worshiping, he gets this entire revelation, which we now know is the book of Revelation. It is one of the most complete revelations of Jesus Christ, which is why we still, even thousands of years after it was written, don't fully understand what's in this book. But twice in the book of Revelation, there's a new song that is sung, and each time it's because a revelation of Jesus was released. You understand that the church itself goes through seasons and times. And at every season, the church is supposed to be flowing in revelation of who Jesus is. And this all comes through not only reading the Word, but it comes through worship, as I'm going to show you. Revelation of who Jesus is. And every time a new revelation is released about Jesus, there's a new song. Listen, the hymnal is not the Bible. Those hymns are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those... Those hymns were written by men who had a revelation of who Jesus is. Victory in Jesus. Why did they write that? Because they were experiencing victory in Jesus. Blessed assurance. Do you know why he wrote that song? Because two of his daughters and his wife had both died. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. He wrote that song out of a revelation of who Jesus is. Pastor Ken, do you not like hymns? No, I love hymns. I went to Bible college. We sang hymns every single morning. Every single morning, except for Saturdays because we didn't have chapel service on Saturday. No, I love hymns. I love songs. I love music. Twice in the the New Testament, Paul instructs the church in Ephesus and he, he instructs the church in Galatia. He says that we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God likes variety. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, the word psalms in the Greek actually means to play an instrument. So you could translate that to mean songs that are played with music. Sing psalms. He says to sing hymns. Now we think of hymns as what's written in the book here, but that's not what Paul's referring to because remember they didn't have hymnals back in the New Testament church. But they did have what they called sacred songs. These are songs that are special to the church for that season that they're in. And every single one of us in, the, in this room have sacred songs, right? We have sacred hymns. For those of you who are in the older generation, it's those hymns. And those hymns are great. It's just like how great, how great, uh, how great that thou art. That, to me, is an eternal song. I don't know if we'll sing it in heaven, but I guarantee you the church will be singing it until we get to heaven. Amen? It's just an eternal song. It's timeless. How great thou art. It's a timeless song, and I hope that from generations from now, they're singing those songs. That's a sacred song, that when we sing that song, that one sacred song, it takes us into the very presence of God. It just does something. It lifts us. It touches us. It releases us. Whatever. That's the type of song that that Paul is talking about singing. Sing the sacred songs. But then he also says, sing spiritual songs. You know what a spiritual song is? It's a song that's literally led by the Holy Spirit. That as we get into the presence of God and the high praises of God is on our lips and and we begin to worship the Lord, there's something the Holy Spirit is actually uh, brought to the earth to magnify Jesus. And so many times as we're singing in the Spirit, as we're going with the flow of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will just uh, put a song on somebody's heart, a song that hasn't even been uh, written yet. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And Paul says that twice in the New Testament, and he's instructing us to give variety when it comes to worship. Yes, sing the old songs, but listen, we cannot refuse to sing the new ones either. It's a command nine times in the Bible, sing a new song to the Lord. Now listen, the thing that we, we have to be culturally relevant, right? Some of us here like bluegrass. I've met a lot of people in Shade Gap that like bluegrass, and some of us don't like bluegrass. <clears throat> you know, it would be a foolish thing for Pastor Ken to call up his friend, uh, Richie Righteous, who lives in Queens, New York. I haven't talked to him in a lot of years. It'd be a foolish thing for me to call him up and say, hey, Rich, uh, why don't you bring your rap music to Shade Gap? on Sunday morning. Let's, let's do that next Sunday for worship. 
<laughs> Just bring it all, buddy. The big bass things and everything. Bring it all. No, that would be stupid. <laughs> and thankfully, God put enough sense into my mind to not do stupid things like that. But see, in Queens, New York, how many of you know that when he gets out on the street and starts singing about Jesus through that culturally relative music, how many of you know that that's attractive to a certain group of people and they're probably going to listen to what he has to say? Now, on the flip side of that, I'm also not going to take the Gaither vocal band to New York. (laughs) Now, they're fine for here. In fact, we put their CD on this morning. Are you guys with me? Music is cultural. Music is cultural. And so, and when Paul gives us the instructions, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, he's telling us, be culturally relevant, but at the same time, bring variety when it comes to the worship, when it comes to worship. So in, in the book of Revelation, there's a revelation that's given, and then there's a new song that is sung. What does this mean to us? Turn to Matthew chapter 16. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that I am? So they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus says this to them, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You have to understand this, church. If Pastor Ken hasn't said anything important this whole year, this is important. A church can only go as deep in their revelation of Jesus as they are in the depth of their worship. A church can only go as deep in their revelation of who Jesus is as they are in their depth of worship. Are you talking about music? I'm not talking about music at all. I'm talking about worship. I don't need music to worship. Worship is the way you cut your grass. Worship is the way you talk to your children. Worship is the way that you give in the offering in in the morning. I'm not trying to get your money. Worship Worship is the way that you conduct your life. I don't need music to worship, but I'll tell you this. When it comes to worship, I love music. I don't need music to worship. You don't, worship is a lifestyle. And if you don't worship the Lord at home, you're going to have a hard time worshiping him here. You can only go as deep in your revelation of who Jesus is as you are in your depth of worship. And music is irrelevant. Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And he's still asking that question to us today. And Simon Peter answers and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And look at what Jesus says to Peter. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. These are some of the most powerful words in the Gospels. And they all started because Peter had a revelation of who Jesus is. Listen, the rock that Jesus was going to build his church on was not Peter. The rock that Jesus was going to build his church on was the rock of revelation. Let me show it to you again. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are, uh, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says in verse number 17, flesh and blood has not, what is the word? Revealed, Revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was, and that revelation didn't come because he was hanging around with the right people, because he was hanging around with the right crowd. That revelation of who Jesus was came because Peter had direct contact with the person of Jesus Christ. And when you have direct contact with the person of who Jesus Christ is, the Father releases revelation into your life, into your mind. Paul, Paul prayed to the church in Ephesus that they would have the spirit of understanding and the spirit of revelation. 
the church is called to have revelation. It doesn't mean that we add to the Bible, but it means that the Bible is open to us. Revelation simply means the uncovering of something, the uncovering of something. Somebody said it here last week, maybe it was Charlie, that you read the same scripture over and over and over again, but there's that one time when you read it and all of a sudden you saw something there that you didn't see before. Are you with me? That's revelation. And the point of worship is not just to get into His presence, but the point of worship is to expose ourselves to the revelation of who He is. Listen, I've read the Bible many times and I've gotten revelation from the Word, but I'm telling you there has been times when I've been on my knees, whether it's in the sanctuary or at home, and there's music and I'm just worshiping, and all of a sudden uh, God opens my mind to something that I never saw before, I never heard before, but it's revelation from the Father and it confirms His Word, but it builds a rock in my life that God can build upon. Are you with me? It's the foundation. Jesus said if somebody builds their house on little pebbles and sand, then when the storm comes, that house is going to fail, right? What is, the, what is the sand? What is the pebbles? Listen, that's just particles of revelation. It's just a few scriptures. I just know a few scriptures. I just know a little bit about God. But when we build our house on the rock... When we build our house on the rock, when the winds and the waves come, what is the rock? The rock is revelation of who He is. And every time in the throne room of God, when there's a new revelation, there's a new song. They sing a new song. A church can only go as deep in their revelation of who Jesus is as they are in their depth of worship. Paul said in Galatians 1.11, he said, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul knew how to worship. Paul and Silas are preaching the gospel, and they're beaten, they're arrested for preaching the name of Jesus, and they're they're arrested and they're beaten. They're, they're beaten, they're hurt, they're bleeding, they're bruised, and instead of caring for their wounds, what do they do? They throw them in prison, right? They throw them in prison. And at the midnight hour, here they are, broken, bruised, and bleeding, and at the midnight hour, the Bible says that they begin to sing. I don't know what they sang, but they began to sing. They began to worship in the darkest moment of their life and in one of the most painful uh, places and experiences that they could be in. Instead of complaining, instead of murmuring, instead of blaming God, they worshipped. They worshipped. They're locked in chains. The Bible says they are in an inner cell to make sure they don't escape because Christians at this point were known for escaping from prison because angels would come in and release them. Are you with me? They're in the inner cell. They're chained to the wall. They're, the bars are closed. But as they begin to worship, what happens? The presence of God comes into that place. And the Bible says that the prison doors are open. Their chains are released. And the jailer gets so afraid because he thinks that they escaped. And he runs in. And what happens? Don't, don't worry. We're still here. <laughs> because when you know how to worship, you don't need to retreat. When you know how to worship, you don't need to run away from a situation. You just stay right there in the midst of it. And in Psalms 23, the Bible says that God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And that table is prepared oftentimes through the act of worship. Through the act of worship. When we just honor God, when we just invite Him into the situation, all of a sudden He comes in. The Bible says in the book of Samuel that a, that a, a spirit would come upon Saul oftentimes. And it, it, it was a depressing spirit that would come upon him and it would torment him. But Saul's servant said to him, Saul, let's find a skilled musician. Let's find somebody who knows how to worship and David would, David would come in. The Bible doesn't even say that he sang. He just would come in and he would play. And as he played his instrument, the Bible says that that evil spirit that distressed Saul would have to flee because worship changes the atmosphere. 
Worship causes demons to have to leave because when the presence of God comes into a situation, when the presence of God comes into your home, when the presence of God comes upon you, the enemy can't stay there. He has to leave. See, if the church desires to be successful in this day and age, then it has to be more than just a song. Amen. 